First, a very special edition of The Sky at Night with Patrick Moore. Thirty-five years ago, Mauna Kea was a desolate, extinct volcano with almost no life on it. Now it's the home of one of the finest and most modern observatories in the world. Here we have the Keck telescope, the largest optical telescope ever made with its 396 inch segmented mirror. Here we have the UCAT, the United Kingdom infrared telescope, which can peer into the dusty regions where stars are being born. And here we have the James Clark Maxwell telescope, which sees in a different way again. This is about as high as a man can work efficiently, because we're at nearly 14,000 feet above the Pacific in the island of Hawaii. And your lungs are taking in only about 39% of their normal intake of oxygen, so you have to be very careful. It's been described as halfway to space, but halfway isn't the whole way. We still get clouds here, and you can't control the weather. If you want absolute perfection, you've got to go into space. Since the start of our Sky at Night programs in April 1957, we've seen the beginning of the space age and its development. At the start, the Russians took the lead with their rocket launching ground at Baikonur in Kazakhstan. Last time we did a Sky at Night anniversary, I couldn't come here to Baikonur, which is the most important of the Russian space launching grounds, uh, the equivalent of the American Cape Canaveral, because visitors definitely weren't allowed. From here, almost all the most important Russian space missions have been launched, including the very first one of all, Sputnik 1. It was the first man-made object to orbit the Earth, a tremendous achievement, and it ushered in a whole new era of exploration. The Sputnik, or rather part of its launcher, was well seen as it passed over Britain. But outside Russia, this great 250-foot dish at Jodrell Bank was the only telescope which could track it. In a way, that was lucky, because the telescope was in trouble, and so was the man who masterminded it. <laughs> I think a few days before it was launched, I said to one of my colleagues, we needed a miracle to, to save us because we were in such disfavor and in so much debt. And um, that miracle did come on October the 4th, 1957, from behind the Iron Curtain. Smaller than Sputnik was Explorer 1, America's first artificial satellite, masterminded by Werner von Braun and launched, like so many others, from Cape Canaveral. It was tremendously important because it led to the discovery of the zones of charged radiation orbiting the Earth, now known as the Van Allen zones, in honor of James Van Allen, the principal investigator. This was really the first major discovery of the space age. Meanwhile, over at Baikonur, the Russians were having great successes. In addition to sending up the first space satellite, the Russians put the first man into space, Yuri Gagarin, in April 1961. But in 1959, they had already started sending unmanned rockets to the moon. Luna 1 went past the moon and sent back important information, such as the fact that the moon has no magnetic field. Luna 2 crash landed on the moon, and Luna 3 went around the moon and sent back the first pictures of the moon's far side that we can never see from Earth because it's always turned away from us. And uh, we were, in fact, the first to show those pictures on the sky at night, because the Russians had sent them uh, straight over. They had, in fact, used my own maps of the moon to correlate the far side pictures with the side of the moon we knew about. But it wasn't only the moon. They also started sending rockets to Mars with mixed success, and to Venus, and their Venera probes, all 16 of them, had been very successful indeed. They sent back the first actual picture from the surface of Venus. The Venera program was a long one and extremely important. Meanwhile, the Americans were concentrating upon manned flight. I am at Cape Canaveral, the main American rocket launching ground, and from here, most of the important scientific missions have been sent up. This is a Mercury capsule, less than nine feet high. And it was in Mercury in May 1961 that Alan Shepard became the first American in space. He made a suborbital hop lasting less than 20 minutes. And then it was also in Mercury that John Glenn completed the first orbit round the Earth by an American. The last Mercury was that flown by Gordon Cooper in 1963. And there the suit he actually wore. He made 22 orbits of the Earth. In turn, Mercury was followed by the Gemini program, which was succeeded by Apollo, the nations were reaching the moon. 
Just look at the size of the VAB, the Vehicle Assembly Building, much the largest structure on Cape Canaveral, and there are very few larger anywhere in the world. And it's here that the great rockets are assembled before being taken out to the launching pad. The Americans went ahead with their moon program, and it was this, plus the idea of a space race, which really caught the public imagination. On the 16th of July, 1969, the huge Saturn V rocket lifted off, taking three men on their way to the moon. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. The climax came on July the 20th, when the lunar module touched down on the bleak rocks of the lunar sea of tranquility. Down two and a half. Forward. Forward. At 30 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Straight shadow. Four forward. Four forward, drift into the right a little. Ready? Down a half. 30 seconds. Forward, just. Good. Ready? Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twin Tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. A few hours later, first Neil Armstrong, then Edwin Alden, stepped out onto the surface of the moon. I'm going to step off the lamb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. They found a strange world. I don't think anyone's ever bettered Buzz Aldrin's description of the lunar scene as magnificent desolation. Afterwards, I talked to Neil Armstrong. The Earth is quite beautiful from space uh, and from the moon. It looks quite small and quite remote, but uh, it's very blue and covered with uh, white lace and <laughs> of the clouds. And the continents are clearly seen, although they have very little color from that distance. You're one of the very, very few people, I think, whose opinion on this is really worth having. In fact, there are only four of you. Do you think, from your knowledge of the moon, having been there, that it is going to be possible in the foreseeable future to set up scientific bases there on anything like a large scale? Oh, I'm quite certain that we'll have such bases uh, in our lifetime, uh, somewhat like the Antarctic stations uh, and similar scientific outposts, continually manned. This is Mission Control at Houston, Texas, the very heart of the American manned space program. In fact, all the manned flights, including, of course, the Apollos, have been, and still are, controlled from here. Apollo 17 was the last in the series, and this was the most scientific of all, because it took the first qualified scientist to the moon. Of course, all the astronauts knew a great deal about science, but this was different. He was Dr. Harrison Jack Schmidt, who was a geologist and been trained as an astronaut specially for the mission. His knowledge proved invaluable. And um, when walking around the moon, he made a most interesting discovery. Wait a minute. What? Where are the reflections? I've been through once. There is orange soil. Well, don't move it till I see it. It's all over. Orange. For a time, it was thought that this indicated recent lunar volcanic activity. In fact, it didn't. The orange color turned out to be due to very small, ancient orange glassy beads, but fascinating nonetheless. The commander of Apollo 17 was Eugene Cernan. My overall impressions of the moon are really overshadowed by my impressions of looking back at the Earth. The moon itself is, is uh, it's been, been called uh, uh, like a sandy beach, it's uh, colorless, it's, uh, it's all those bland things. Uh, that we think of as being unbeautiful, but it is beautiful. It's majestic. It's it's got towering mountains and it's got a tremendously overpowering landscape. And yet, the the most significant thing about being on the moon is to realize you are 
in effect standing in a in the middle of a of a three-dimensional charcoal picture and looking back through the through the blackness of space through the blackness blackness of space that is filled with sunlight yet and looking at the earth because the earth it, it's life it's color it's 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 beauty and to me far beyond even stepping on on, on the surface of the moon is to think back and look back at home, at our star, at, 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 at our Earth, at our planet. Well, Earth looks beautiful because of its atmosphere, but there's no atmosphere on the moon. I wonder, what was the sky like? Well, it, it's hard to imagine that one can look into blackness uh, and be surrounded by sunlight. It, that's a paradox, but that's exactly what it is. Uh, uh, when you are in sunlight on the surface of the moon, if you look and concentrate uh, very, very heartily, you can see stars out there. And of course, you can see predominantly the Earth in its multi-blue colors out there. When you go behind the moon, when you're flying, of course, when we're on the moon, we're in sunlight the whole time. But when we were flying around the moon, we were, went uh, into darkness, into the shadow of, of, of the moon itself. And then you are in probably the blackest black a human being can, can imagine in his mind. You are out of sight of the earth. Uh, you are out of sight of the reflection of anything except the stars. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of stars. And it's so black, you cannot even see the surface of the moon that you're flying, just, to, just maybe 80 kilometers above. On the moon, the sky is black all the time. There's no air to scatter the sunlight around and make the sky blue. But there's more to it than that. Light is a wave motion, and the distance between one wave crest and the next is called the wavelength. If the wavelength is shorter than that of light, we have ultraviolet, X-rays, and gamma rays. If the wavelength is longer than that of light, we have infrared, microwaves, and radio waves. Most of these, apart from visible light and some of the radio waves, are blocked by the Earth's atmosphere, so from ground level you can't study them. The higher you go, the less air there is above you to block the radiations. That's why Mauna Kea is so useful. But even here, at nearly 14,000 feet, there's still a good deal of atmosphere above you. And that's why we want to go higher. We want to go into space. And the obvious way is to launch satellites. Satellites have told us more about astronomy than we could ever have learned otherwise. For example, what about X-ray astronomy? That began in 1962 with the discovery of an X-ray source by a rocket. But X-rays can't get down to the Earth from space, and that's why space research methods are essential. By now, many X-ray sources have been discovered. One of these is Cygnus X-1, which we believe to be made up of a giant star together with a black hole companion. A black hole being a region of space around an old, collapsed star, which is now pulling so strongly that not even light can get away from it. Material from the giant star is being pulled into the black hole. And as this happens, the material is heated so intensely that it gives off X-rays. And to study these, we need to use satellites. The latest satellite is ROSAT. Well, ROSAT has, has been extremely productive. It's increased the number of known X-ray sources and extreme ultraviolet sources by a factor of 100. In addition, many new objects have been discovered. For instance, there are quite a few new supernova remnants that were previously unknown that we found. And at the other extreme in scale, uh, superclusters have been detected, which are now the largest uh, known structures in the whole universe. Using ROSAT, I gather you've discovered a white dwarf binary. What's the significance of that? One of the reasons why that's interesting is that white dwarfs, of course, traditionally have been observed as single stars. Uh, it's very difficult in the visible part of the spectrum to see them when they're in a close binary system with a, a bright main sequence star. But with an extreme ultraviolet camera, of course, they show up very well. So I think the bottom line will be uh, that we're finding there are a lot more white dwarfs around, many of them hidden in binary systems that, than we ever knew of before. X-ray astronomy is truly international. Can you say something about Ginga and Spectrum X, for example? Well, Ginga is the project that we have been working on for the last uh, four or five years, in fact, longer than that, if you go pre-launch with the Japanese. And it's a project that was highly successful. It was intended to fly for two years. It finished up working for nearly five. 
and everything worked perfectly until re-entry last October. Spectrum X, or JetX, our part in that, of course, is, is uh, another international project, and that's one in the future, where we're building this new type of telescope that we hope to fly on a, uh, what was a Soviet satellite, it will now be a CIS satellite, in the late 90, 1994 period. Leicester is very much a centre of X-ray astronomy. What are the main aspects of British research? What sets our programme apart, perhaps, from the Americans, the Japanese, the Germans, is that we, we don't have our own national space programme, of course, so it means that we have necessarily to work on an international basis. So probably the thing that's special about the UK programme in X-ray astronomy is that it's very broadly international. Another branch of astronomy that can be studied only from space is ultraviolet. Again, this is because the ultraviolet radiations are blocked by the Earth's atmosphere and can't reach the surface. But ultraviolet astronomy is important. It helps us to understand the most remote stars and star systems. One spacecraft, operated from the Goddard Space Flight Center near Washington, has been working on this for many years. The IUE, or International Ultraviolet Explorer, is controlled from this room. It's the only satellite that's controlled directly in real time. And that's happening at this very moment. The IUE was launched in 1978 with an estimated lifetime of three years. But it's still working perfectly and still sending back valuable data. We observe objects from the solar system to stars to galaxies, the whole gamut. Uh, one of the things we did very well was looking at Supernova 1987A. We were able to get on it in a few hours after it exploded. We were able to uh, identify the progenitor star and we were able to obtain a complete light curve because we of course have no clouds or anything to stop us from continually going through. Uh, we have also been instrumental at IUE was discovering that the sun uh, lives inside of a small local little cloud uh, of small extent of interstellar matter and then there's a big void around it uh, which is free of matter. What will finally bring it to the end of this glorious career? Well, it's not absolutely certain, of course. It could die tomorrow, as spacecraft uh, do. But we cannot reverse the de degradation of the solar panels. Uh, probably, I don't think we have more than another maybe three years, its original mission lifetime on those. Uh, we could always have a catastrophic failure. You never know. Ground control, this is TNC West. Standing by for your pre fast briefing. Goddard also controls other spacecraft, GRO, the Gamma Ray Observatory. Launched last year, it's already sending back information about bursts of gamma rays from extremely energetic objects. And just a few days ago, COBE, the Cosmic Background Explorer, made what had been called one of the discoveries of the century. It's found evidence of the earliest period in the making of the universe, the seeds which form the galaxies. But nearer home, what of the planets? The first planet to be contacted by a space probe was Venus, way back in 1962 with Mariner 2. And Mariner 2, like all the later American planetary probes, was controlled and monitored from the JPL, or Jet Propulsion Laboratory, at Pasadena in California. And the nerve center is the DSN, or Deep Space Network. And this is an incredible place. It's pure equator mass. It's here that the signals from the probes are being received, and it's here the commands are sent out to them. And remember, the DSN had been in action 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, for over 30 years now. So, what have we learned? Venus first. Well, Venus didn't turn out to be the kind of world we expected. We'd expected to find a good deal of water there. Well, we didn't. What we found was a very hot world indeed, with a temperature not far short of 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, with a choking atmosphere made of carbon dioxide and clouds made of sulfuric acid. We've learned more since then. The mariners and, of course, the Russian veneers, some of which made soft landings there, have told us a great deal. But the latest probe, Magellan, should improve on any of these. It's not going to land on Venus. It's going round and round the planet, and it's mapping the surface by radar in more detail than had ever been possible before and should tell us what Venus as a world is really like. 
Well, Magellan is a spacecraft that was launched by NASA on May 4th of 1989, and we arrived at Venus on August 10th of 1990. Uh, the spacecraft has one major instrument on board, and that is the, the radar. You can see this large dish antenna at the top of the spacecraft, and that's the antenna that we use to send radar waves down to the planet's surface. They're reflected back, and from those reflections, we turn those into images. We can't use a conventional camera to image the surface of Venus because you get basically pictures of clouds. Venus is covered by a greenhouse effect, uh, so that you need a radar to penetrate those clouds and produce an image of the surface. We also have an altimeter on board which measures the surface height and allows us to build up a topographic map of the surface. What's the main point of going to Venus? Well, Venus is uh, known among scientists as the most Earth-like of the terrestrial planets. And that's because the two planets have about the same mass and about the same density. We think they're composed of about the same material. Now, that's important because we think that the size of a planet and what it's made out of have a lot to do with the sort of geologic activity that you see on the planet. Namely, the larger a planet is, the more heat it produces, and heat is what drives geologic processes. So therefore, the geology of the Earth and the geology of, of Venus might be very similar, allowing us to learn a lot more about the Earth. What are the main results so far? Uh, we've found many interesting things, many interesting volcanic features. For instance, we've found uh, channels that seem to have been thermally eroded or, or where the heat of the lava actually cuts down and erodes a uh, channel into the surface. We recently found one of these channels that's about 7,000 kilometers long. These are very unusual features that imply some really unusual compositions and styles of eruption uh, that we don't really understand, so that's been very exciting. We've seen uh, very unusual tectonic features, large rift zones where the crust of the planet seems to be pulling apart, uh, large mountain ranges over 11 kilometers above the surface of the planet. Um, we've seen just so much tectonic activity and so much volcanic activity uh, that we're really still struggling to figure out how this planet works and how it compares to the Earth. A second probe has been looking at Venus, and this is the impressive Galileo. Frankly, it wasn't meant to. Galileo is a Jupiter mission, and the original plan was to go straight from the Earth to Jupiter. But various cutbacks and difficulties with the launcher meant that the plan had to be altered, and Galileo's had to go by a much more circuitous route, rather like um, going to Bognor to Brighton via Carlisle. It's had to bypass Venus once and the Earth twice, and in passing Venus, it sent back some useful data.